Welcome to the first Thought Talk strand of the Galway International Arts Festival Autumn Edition. This unusual version of the festival is taking place against the backdrop of the COVID-19 epidemic, which has hit arts events particularly hard, where people have lost their livelihoods, where venues have closed down. You're here to, today in the Black Box Theatre, which ordinarily would have the wonderful Killian Murphy and an end to watch play behind me on the stage. Instead, you have a bunch of really smart scientists. Which is better, we don't know, but we're going to find out. Uh, we're very proud to be able to present a varied and interesting festival and to embed our wonderful speakers for first thought within it. A very warm welcome to our online viewers, joining us live for each of the thoughts. Remember, you can watch them all later on the festival channels or listen to them on the festival podcast series. And finally, our first thought talks are presented in partnership with NUI Galway, the festival's education uh, partner. It's only a few months since the world had to come to terms with a serious global pandemic, a new virus about which very little was known, except that it was very contagious and often lethal. How has Ireland managed the novel coronavirus COVID-19? Were we ready for it? Did the government make the right choices? Has the population bought into the rules for its suppression or elimination? What is the science now on the virus? One of the incidental effects of the virus has been the emergence of scientists and medical people who have become excellent communicators on our airwaves, informing, educating, and reassuring us at a time when we badly need them, and sometimes being very funny as well, which helps. You need a laugh in the middle of all the surrounding gloom. To discuss how we've done and where we are now, we have a stellar panel of experts from different areas. Luke O'Neill, Professor of Biochemistry at Trinity College, Dublin. Dr. Catherine Motherway, Intensive Care Specialist that was a Freudian slip, scare specialist. <laughs> frightens me, wonderful. At University Hospital Limerick, Dr. Mary Favier, President of the Irish College of General Practitioners, and Paul Moyner, Professor of Biology at Maynooth University, all absolutely expert in their own fields. Our moderator would be David McCullough, one of our best-known broadcasters, recently departed from prime time for the 6-1 News. He's had a very long and productive career in RTE. My mother used to worry about him standing outside government buildings in the cold with his big scarf, <laughs> telling us the latest piece of dreadful news about what was going on inside. And he always had a lovely rueful expression on his face as if he knew the horror of what he was imparting. He's also an eminent historian who's written the definitive two-volume biography of Eamon de Valera, universally praised when it appeared. He will guide our experts through the labyrinth of COVID-19 and our response to it. David. Thanks very much, Katrina, and uh, thank you to our lovely audience, uh, both here and online, and indeed to our guests. And I want to start, if I may, with Catherine. Ah. Because Catherine, um, the intensive scare specialist, um, you <laughs> were good enough to do an interview with Primetime early on in this thing, and it really stayed with me, and it stayed with a lot of people. It scared the bejesus out of me, um, because you were very direct, and you warned people about the dangers, as you said, you do not want to end up in my ICU. And you said people needed to treat each other like pariahs. And it was very well expressed. How important was it that that message was delivered and that that message landed with the public at that, at that precise moment? I think one of the worries that we had in intensive care was that we wouldn't be able to cope, that we would have to refuse treatment to people who would benefit from it. And we had a real anxiety that people didn't quite understand that or understand what had happened in Italy, in Wuhan, and was happening at that time in Madrid and in London. So it was very important, I think, that people didn't think that just because you got on a ventilator that fixed it. Um, it was very important that people realised that this was a new disease and we didn't know a lot about it. And it had the effect of overwhelming some hospital services, which both affected people who got COVID and people who didn't get COVID. And those people needed access to medicine like they've always done and hospital like they've always done. And what I wanted to say, and I remember saying at one of the medical leaders forums meetings was, I wish you'd stop talking about ventilators because mm. that doesn't really matter. What matters is not getting this disease. And what matters is not really hospitals, it's public health and public health measures. Obviously hospitals had to respond, but we were only going to respond to what came to us and the thing that was going to prevent the surge was the public health measures. Yeah. And 
you really don't want to end up in an ICU anyway. Nobody does. Nobody wants to get any disease. Um, but in particular, if you end up in critical care, you, you, you know, it's, it's not a great place to be. I, we do try and help people there, obviously, and we do our best. Indeed. Um, Luke, uh, one of the things that struck me, with that, that, that clip with, with Catherine, we, we put it out online, it was viewed over a million times, I think, on, on YouTube, and there's a lot of people in Britain saying, at last, somebody has given the, the unvarnished truth, and it was, it was said with, with um, uh, reference to what was happening in Britain at the time with political leaders. The government here, in fairness, was on board with that message right from the beginning. That was important too, wasn't it? They were, it was key to it. I think we're all very proud of the government at that stage, we'd have to say. We're, we don't often say that, do we? We're usually no. kicking them, but, um, but they did a great job. Well, we, we will a little we'll later, later on. on we'll, we'll, we'll give the new government a kick in a minute, but um, <laughs> Leo um, did a great job. That speech he made, we all thought was superb. I mean, can you imagine the Irish complied with this really stringent thing? That was brilliant as well. So I think the government did a great job early on. And really, we'd all agree with this, it is about messaging ultimately. And especially in this situation, you've got to get the message really, really clear. Bring the people with you. Now more than ever, I think we need that, actually. We're sitting in the middle of this, you see. Mm. And, and people like Martha would emphasize, I mean, it's a very serious disease. At that time, my memory is, ah, it's just like a cold or a flu, nothing to worry about, you know. The scaremongering charge kept coming up, and we all get this for the whole time, by the way. You're overreacting to these mm. things. But if you're in a hospital, like Martha, you see it up front and personal, you know. It's a very serious disease. So, so luckily, at that phase of it, the government, I think, did a really good job. Uh, Mary, you were uh, uh, sort of at the opposite end of, of the medical process, um, to Catherine uh, as, a, as a GP, how well prepared, I mean, you can't really be completely prepared for something like this, but how well prepared was the health service in general and the GP service in particular for what was coming down the tracks? Not at all, really, in the sense that we would have had a certain theoretical guidance around infection control and the, the important measures around it and, and GPs would have understood so all those basics. But we went into rapid overdrive in terms of education and training and, and resourcing GPs over about two or three weeks. Uh, I mean, I remember giving a talk at the end of February to a group of GP tr trainers, and it was a theoretical talk. Within two weeks, we were down and dirty about how to use a mask, how to put a don and doff gear, you know, what were the appropriate touch techniques, how to manage throughput into your surgery, how to do telephone triage, video triage, incredible numbers of new skills needed for the three and a half thousand GPs out there. And to be fair, they rose to the challenge. But it was a challenge and because it's entirely new. And you, then, you know, so you, it wasn't just GPs, it's all the people who work in general practices, like practice nurses and administration staff. And they were a version of the front line and the, the absolute need to keep them safe. Because this applies now, as we're into this more stable, but into a second wave. If we don't keep general practice standing across the winter, we will have an extraordinary knock-on into emergency departments and effectively into... In, into and, and as Catherine says, like, it's not just people with COVID. There's the whole range of health problems that have to be dealt with. And, and things have changed in, in the way that GPs deal with patients. There's a lot more telephone diagnosis, a lot more consultations over, over video and, and whatever. Yeah, I mean, and some of that, there's, there's always been a certain amount of telephone and video consultation, but it brings challenges and there are problems with it. We had to sort of get over ourselves and say they need to be done. So there, there's everything from you know, confidentiality and data protection, and so there's a cumbersome procedure, for instance, can you text a patient? You have to, they have to not just consent to get texts, they have to have written consent to get texts for GDPR reasons. We effectively said we have to suspend all that, we have to text the patients, mm. we have to set up times, we have to telephone them, we have to do different ways of recording those consultations, we have to do different types of safety netting where you're trying to protect the patient within the limits of what you can do over the telephone. And it's not ideal. I mean, I've had, I, so I've had patients in the car. I've had patients in the swimming pool answering the phone for their consultation. Some, one of my GP colleagues recently had somebody on a roller coaster answering the phone for <laughs> telephone consultation. Which is but, probably a good metaphor for uh, COVID. Indeed. It's how many of us have felt for the last number of months. Uh, Paul, we'll talk a little bit later about the future use of, of lockdowns uh, and, and localised lockdowns. And I know you have your, your views on, on, on their efficiency and, the, and their effectiveness. But in the context of March, in the context of this freight train coming at us and, and not being prepared, was lockdown the only option? Yeah, I think at that stage, David, I don't, I don't think we had a choice in terms of, like, if you cast your mind back to that time period, you know, when ICUs were filling up, and Catherine noticed very well, and there was an air of sort of unpredictability about, you know, what was going to happen. 
And then if you looked at it sort of in terms of learning lessons from what other countries were doing, you know, lockdown was the way to go. So certainly at that stage, David, you know, you couldn't blame the country for going into lockdown. I think it was an entirely natural uh, response. OK, and we'll, we'll talk, as I say, we'll talk later about, about their future use. We, we've given praise to the system and to the government for the way it, it handled things, but mistakes were obviously made in, in, in certain areas. It took a long time for testing to ramp up in particular, which, which was a big problem. Yeah. Now, having said that, David, it has come in for a lot of criticism, but I, I don't think we should underestimate the challenge of setting up that testing system was absolutely enormous. And we compare very favourably, actually, in terms of when you look at the number of tests we do nationally, you know, that's, that's a very good parameter and, you know, we fare really, really well there. But I think, you know, over the last number of months, it's probably disappointing in terms of we, we still seem to struggle with the testing. And if you look at examples, even recent examples where, you know, maybe a month, two months ago, uh, the Giant Oireachtas Committee on COVID, they met with the HSE and they were told, you know, we have a robust, agile system. But yet, you know, two, three weeks later, I always remember at the end of July, there was that sudden case of 80 cases, 80 positive cases. When I looked on that day, there were, I think, 4,000 tests done. There are two of them, actually, in 2,000 in the hospital. Now, I would immediately expect that when you see that red flag, you'd immediately go test across all factories. But six days later, it was down to 2,000 per day. So again, that, to me, doesn't strike as being an agile, robust system. So again, when you hear messages to the Giant Oireachtas Committee saying, we have you know, a robust, agile system, it worries me then when the reality is very different. So that, that is a concern. Okay. Um, another thing that was very slow to get going, Luke, was the advice about masks. And uh, I think it's the same here, but certainly in Britain, uh, the government kept saying, we're following the science and we're yep. following the evidence. But there's no evidence that if you wear a mask and I wear a mask, that means I didn't get, catch COVID off you when we both went to done stores. You can't prove a negative. So yep. by, by saying that mantra of we're relying on the evidence, they were actually missing a trick. Well, the science of masks is rotten, is the first problem. Nobody ever did a clinically controlled trial, put masks on a thousand people, leave a thousand without, see what happens. Nobody's done that ever. And lots of the studies in the 70s and 80s were about flu, they were badly done. And if you're against masks, you can cite a dodgy study from 1978 saying masks don't work, for instance. So the science behind it was always a bit loose. That began to change. So. Uh, people got really stuck into masks and look, looked for scientific evidence. And to me, by about March, the evidence was compelling. It wasn't gold-plated, it wasn't double-blind placebo-controlled, but common sense tells you masks will work. Why do we cough into our elbows? You know, what gets me is people will do this and they won't wear a mask. That's ridiculous, you know? So in other words, common sense began to come into the debate. Now the science began to get better. And I changed my position because back in March or in February, I was saying, look, the, the guidelines were wear it if you've got symptoms, because you'll cough this out. Mm. Wear a mask in case you've got a cough. That changed because it can spread by speaking. That's the first piece of science that tells us masks might work. The second is aerosols come out when you speak. Masks definitely block aerosols. There was direct evidence of masks. They were two pieces of evidence. The third was very good epidemiology. In Germany, for instance, two places right beside mm. each other. One began wearing masks, one didn't. The case rate went up and the one that didn't. The last piece of evidence was an animal model. Now, people go, it's animals, it's not humans. Again, we use animals in science all the time. They had two sets of hamsters, it sounds a bit strange, put a mask between the cage and the other set didn't get infected. You know? So when you add it all up, the science is absolutely compelling that masks stop the spread. And you can use science then, not in the gold-plated double placebo way that we'd all love, but still, it's enough for me. You know, it's a bit like a smoking gun, David. You know, there's a massive amount of smoke coming out of that gun, right, that says masks work. Okay, mm. so you, even, if you, if you, even if you can't find the bullet, you know... But that there's, exactly other, there's another issue, the, the mask, mask is very complex, and I agree, I changed my mind over time as well, mm. is the, the, what, there's evidence that when people wear masks, they then become casual about other things. They, 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 yeah. they first of all take the masks off and they put them on the, the restaurant table, mm. you know, and they potentially contaminate the table. But they, they then, you know, contaminate their hands, they don't wash their hands, and people tend, to, there's evidence that people get more slack in their other measures, or they, they get slack about the social distancing. They think they can wear a mask and then it'd be in on top. If we all wore masks, we could go to the pub. Mm. So it has to be a very nuanced message, but I agree. I think the overwhelming evidence now is if in doubt, wear a mask. The and it doesn't, it doesn't cause any harm. If you give a, single hint, if you give a single hint, they're not going to work, people won't wear them. 
Yeah, so it became a massive messaging question for me. You know, people look for excuses not to do stuff. And then you kind of, oh, it mightn't work, I'm not going to, especially if it's an expert. Oh, this mightn't work, I'm not going to wear it. You know? So it's a very, very kind of complex thing in a way to convince people. Um, Catherine, the other sort of area that a lot of people have been critical of is, is, about, is around residential care homes yes. and the fact that the, the virus got into those places where the most vulnerable people were. Did we drop the ball there, do you think? I think, to be fair, that at that point, the WHO and others were saying asymptomatic carriage was not a big issue. And in fact, we now know that it is. So at various stages in pandemics, you discover more things. And initially they were saying that it wasn't an issue. To be fair, the people who were running the homes did close them down to visitors, but staff had to go in and out. And staff may have been carrying the virus unknown to them. Mm. And in that sector, they rely heavily on um, agency staff who go from place to place and work from place to place, and they always have done so. And I think some of them were ill-prepared when it came to PPE. And the other thing is that HICWA stopped inspecting at the outset. They, they stopped inspecting. So HICWA, obviously, they, everybody stopped doing a lot of stuff. And I mean, I think essentially, we should continue to monitor our care homes. I mean, I've thought about this, and I've thought about the way we take care of our elderly population. Initially, the elderly people died because they were living at home with their families, and people brought it home to them. So intergenerational living wasn't good either for old people. Um, in residential care homes, there were many people who did a lot of work and had a dreadful time with, with this disease. And it, was, and it still is dreadful for the families of those mm. people who cannot visit. They're still restricted visiting which is very limited for, with reasonable cause. I think now that they're actually screening the staff, it is going to help them. And interestingly enough, like many, many of the patients in the care homes had it and were asymptomatic. Obviously, there was a huge, huge burden of care, but there were a significant number of those patients who did test positive who were asymptomatic. It wouldn't be my great area of expertise. Mary would know more mm. about that. I mean, I don't work in residential mm. care area mm. much, but we would have had patients uh, presented to hospital, yeah. obviously. From do you want to add anything to that, Mary? Yeah, I, I don't think it's so much we dropped the ball. I think as we didn't recognise the ball. Exactly. And the ball wasn't a large football that was coming over the fence. It was multiple ping pongs mm. or even smaller. You know, and, so, and also, we, we got a huge advantage by looking at what was happening in Wuhan and looking at what was happening in Italy. But they didn't have the same nursing home, residential care home experience you know, in ex you know, that we have in the sense of the, the numbers. So, and we were very much focusing on, I think, the, that healthy cohort of 40 and 50 year olds who were getting it and ending up in intensive care. Um, the tr people who travelled, for instance, we had this big thing about people who travelled, whereas it turned out to be not the issue. I think the longer term about n nursing homes and residential care homes is that we need to look at why we have so, such a high percentage of our elderly population living in them. Because, and there's effectively perverse incentives in Ireland to move our older population into residential care facilities because th there's been significant tax incentives, first of all, to build them. You know, there's capital incentives. And then the Fair Deal scheme incentivizes and provides financial packages to go into them, whereas there's no equivalent financial package to stay in your home. And as a GP, we, we're just worn out trying to help people get the rail to get into the bathroom, the mm -hmm. walk-in shower, the ramp to the front door, the, the home help who will come in morning and evening. And you effectively, you know, up to and even now, can't get that service but you can get a package to go into a nursing home. Right. And obviously, if you're living at home, there's much greater independence. And, Absolutely. Know. I mean, because we see now the, the, the difficulty with nursing homes now is all the restrictions, the significant psychological morbidity that's yeah. affecting our older populations. I mean, it's, it's horrible. They're effectively locked in. Yeah. Sorry, Paul. Yeah, I think early on, David, you know, when you saw those images coming in, especially from Italy, I think that scared us a lot. And as a result, there was sort of, I think, almost a complete focus on hospitals, acute hospitals, and this absolute concern and being really scared in terms of exceeding capacity and not being able to cope. Um, I look back and sort of you asked then, well, you know, did we not see, even at that stage, in terms of the most susceptible group of people were the older people? And it's something I don't think we learned. And... Certainly, I think, you know, when you write about this and you look back, and especially in terms of how we dealt with things initially, and I think ultimately the question has to be asked, you know, did we protect our most vulnerable? And I think in that situation we failed, mm -hmm. and we failed so far. Now, hopefully we've learned the lessons and, you know, that won't happen again. But I think certainly that initial context in terms of almost complete focus in the hospitals, and it's understandable, but I think 
then you know the social care and nursing home sector was sort of forgotten. Need, needed more attention. Okay, I'm going to move on to talk about the present situation. But just before I do, uh, before anybody gets too downbeat about things, Catherine, I, um, I think it was Paul Reed during the week was was given the stats that 79% of people admitted to ICU with COVID survived, which is better, I think, than than the international experience. 47% mortality in the United Kingdom. Ooh. It will be interesting. Crude mortality, and when I say that word, it means an absolute, just, it means X number of people died. Mm. <laughs> but comparing that sort of figure from one population to the other in ICU doesn't work that well. The better thing to do is use what we call a standardised mortality rate. Interestingly enough, we actually contribute our ICU data to ICNARC, which is the British audit system. Mm. We export all our data, and we will be able to compare the outcomes using standardised mortality in, in, in relatively soon, I think. Mm -hmm. Whether or not we, because we've less beds in the ICUs, we're very used to making difficult decisions and deciding who will and who may not benefit mm. from critical care. And we do that without COVID all of the time. Um, so it, I think the mortality figures in the, in the United Kingdom reflect a certain amount of out of resource. I think they were really, really pushed in certain areas. Mm. So they may not have given the time that was required for these patients. They take a long time to get better in ICU. Um, and in Ireland, our, our, the patients who died were in the ICU for the same length of time, roughly, as the patients who survived. Right. So we didn't give up on them early. And they took two, three weeks on average to get better, which is a long ICU stay. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we've done well in that sense. And that <coughs> compares well internationally thus far. But I think as we move through the pandemic, we'll learn more about whether or not we just didn't admit some of the people that they admitted in other countries. Right. And that certainly would have been the case in Italy because they would have a very different end of life expectation in Southern Europe than we have in Northern Europe. Many people would choose in later stages of life to have the run at the ICU, whereas in Ireland, a lot of people don't want to do that. Right. They say, I've had it, I don't want to do that doctor, thank you very much. Okay. So right. do we have a very different attitude at the end of life particularly if someone comes and tells you, no, I don't think this is going to work. Most of them will, most patients don't want to go there if they don't okay, think it, it'll benefit them. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, David, there's a very interesting study there, this uh, SCOPY study. So they've done a serial prevalence study in terms of looking basically what percentage of the population has been infected by this. Actually, combined with a very low number, surprised mm. me. I thought it was yes. going to be higher, but mm. it was 1.7%. Mm. If you calculate the infection fatality rate from that, it gives us an infection fatality rate of 2%, which is really, really high because the yes. CDC is coming out with a figure of about 0.6%. Iceland has come out at 0.3. So it's either we've underestimated in terms of the number of people who've been infected here. Mm. Is I can't believe, for example, Ireland covered an infection fatality rate 10 times more than Iceland. Right. Now, Iceland, okay, the number of deaths were quite low, so in terms of the accuracy of that, but certainly it's something mm. to consider. Okay, let's talk about the situation right at this minute. Luke, uh, how well do we have it under control at the moment or not? It's okay at the moment, it will be the consensus, David, but getting back to the numbers briefly, right, don't trust any numbers, okay, is one view. And the reason is because I saw a great piece on this in Nature yesterday. It's like trying to measure rainfall during a hurricane, okay? It's impossible. It's changing all the time, right? And in fact, any numbers we have, we have, we have to use them. We have to use some metric. Of course we do. But ultimately, these numbers will shake down two, three years from now, really. The two types of death are, of course, as Catherine knows, death from the virus or some other condition that you're dying yeah. for some other reason, you know? Mm. Very hard to say, what, and that can be sporadic, the statistics can be tricky. So the numbers are funny. Now when you get, where are we now? We look at numbers, don't we? And again, I've just said they're unreliable, so it's tricky. But <laughs> having said that, um, you know, the cases per day, and we see these numbers every mm. night, don't we? That's probably pretty useless as a metric anyway. It's all about trends. It is stable in Ireland, that, that seems to be the case, talking to our epidemiologists who are expert in this. So we stabilize things. The big fear, of course, is it'll go up even higher. Higher, you know, so at the moment it's reasonable, I would say. Okay, Mary, um, in terms of, of, of you know, you're looking at, at societies starting to reopen, schools have gone mm. back, various restrictions have been lifted and then part, partially reimposed. Where, where do you think we need to be concentrating on? Where would you be worried about? The biggest concern is all the non-COVID illness and morbidity and mortality, as we call it. Uh, so all the, the non-COVID things, the, the, the cancers, the heart disease, mm. you know, the bowel problems, whatever it is, the psychological issues, they don't go away. And some of them are actually worse in a, in a COVID scenario. And our, our health services effectively came to, our hospital services came to a screeching halt you know, in March. 
but they haven't really opened up fully and effectively since. And we still have very significant deployment of health service staff into testing and tracing, which I think it shouldn't happen. I think at this stage we should have recruited you know, individuals into testing and tracing that are standalone and so that the speech and language therapists can go back to work and the radiology people can go back to work and so on and so forth. But from a GP point of view, there's a huge pent up issue, particularly we're getting into a real public-private divide and, and health inequality because of it. Because if you have private, because we reverted back to private health care again after the public you know, hospitals had taken over the private ones and, and reverted back. So if you've got private health, health insurance, basically life is going on as normal in health care. You can still access your services. It's a little bit more awkward and the social distancing and the appointment might be delayed. But if you're in the, in the public sector, which is the vast majority of people and is everybody's entitlement, and from where I work, all my patients, there is, there's still effectively no service in many areas. The, you know, for instance, I couldn't tell you at this moment where I can get a chest X-ray done as a rapid access chest, chest, chest X-ray because so many of the services are either not working or very slow. And that has huge knock-on effects. So for instance, if I can't get a chest X-ray, how can I diagnose somebody with lung cancer? And if, they, if I can't diagnose them, how do I send them to the rapid access lung cancer mm. clinic? And on from there. And I think as a society, we need, now need to say we have to live with COVID and make sure our non-COVID services function to the degree they were stretched at the best of times there were waiting lists at the best of times but they, because we we have so much almost chatter around covid which is appropriate it's very easy to ignore all the other stuff and mm. we need to pay attention to that so paul are we going to be paying a price for, uh, a sort of a non-covid price for this pandemic for quite some time to come i, I sense we will david <clears throat> i look you know going back to the lockdown situation mm. um i think it's a case of trade-offs you, you gain some things now, you can argue in terms of how strict the lockdown should be, but in terms of the other trade-offs, so some, obviously, healthcare and Mary's just mm. described them. And Like, if you look each year, like, we've got, what, 43,000 new diagnoses of cancers. So, for the first six months this year, I don't know many of them we've missed, but in terms of non-COVID, are there going to be early deaths from that? Yes, there will be. Economically, like, we're looking at half a million people unemployed, half a million people on employment subsidy. At some stage, that has to be paid back. And one of the groups of people, we talk about obviously older people being more susceptible to the virus. Ironically, younger people are more protected, but are actually going to probably be exposed most in terms of paying back for this. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's something that probably hasn't been discussed. And I think we need to be mindful of that when we begin to look and, you know, we criticise young people in terms of, mm -hmm. okay, maybe not complying as much with the social distancing now. I think younger people have some, and I think this is understandable, they've looked at the risk They've established the risk for themselves, and that's probably reflected somewhat in their behaviour. And I think, to a degree, it's natural. So it's trying to still work with them, emphasise the need to sort of stay with this. Um, but again, I think there's, when at some stage, David, there's going to be an equation in terms of what you gain, what you lose, and what you lose, some of that will only become apparent in the next six months, one, two, three years. Yeah. And I think when we look at that equation in the end, I'm not yeah, but at the same time, if the if the virus gets loose in the community again and go, yep. goes um, goes viral, uh, becomes rampant mm -hmm. again, yep. and the likes of, of Catherine are suddenly Absolutely. overwhelmed in the ICU, you know, you can't have that. So, so, so certainly, David, I wouldn't advocate a situation where you just completely open up and mm. go back to complete mm. normal. I think if you look at lockdown in terms of how effective that has been, it has been effective. But elements of the lockdown, I would argue, has been effective. So even when I look at the Irish data, when you look at that data, in terms of, you know, you've heard of this OR number and the mm. RT number. When I look at that, and I look at the Irish data, I see that that coming below one was due to actually the restrictions that were brought into play before full lockdown was implemented. So again, I worry about a strategy now going forward where immediately the response is, you talk about either local lockdowns and if it gets really bad, full lockdown. If that is our strategy, I just think that that is no strategy. So I think we can, we can open up, we can concentrate on those elements that we know works. So that social distancing, you know, good hygiene, masks, restricting big indoor gatherings, you know, especially poorly ventilated areas. And then complement that with a really, really strong testing tracing system. Mm -hmm. I think if you do that, you can open up society in a reasonable way where we begin to get back to some degree of normality. But I think this idea of full lockdown is just not good. Just stay with that testing thing for a second. Um, 
because it, it, it's not a very pleasant experience to take a, a relative to have a test and it was you know not yeah. not very nice but um but very efficient uh, in 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 her case she rang the gp yep. at 11 o'clock i think on a, on a wednesday she had the test that afternoon the result 24 hours later so that was great and yep. that but it needs to be doing that most of the time, if not all the time, for it to be effective. Yeah, it needs to be very efficient. So we look at numbers. Numbers is one element, but it's the speed as well. And again, what people should be aware of, there's actually two streams of testing. There's one actually hospital-based, which is very efficient. Mm. That's obviously needed for clinical management in terms of managing staff mm. and patients. But the community testing, that's where we seem to struggle. And again, the structures, we just didn't have the infrastructure in place. So essentially, that has been subcontracted to a private company, you know, at very, very high costs. Um, and again... You know, very early on, the HSE strived to get to this 100,000 per week. Um, then it reduced significantly. But then, and Mary's alluded to this in terms of, for example, tracing, you were taking people from other areas of the health uh, mm. sector. Uh, so putting that on a sustainable basis, and I, I often think looking forward in terms of coming up with a, you know, a sensible strategy, you almost need to couch it in the context of, let's say, OK, there won't be a vaccine, let's say, for three years. There will be no more improvements, you know, in terms of treatments for the next three years. What is your strategy going to be? Mm. And I think that's sort of a sensible context to look at. Uh, Luke, in terms of testing, now, if somebody has symptoms, they go and get tested. How much should we be just testing randomly? to see if we, can, if we can catch asymptomatic cases. Absolutely. The, the, the simple thing is to test as many people as often as you can, and the surveillance testing is well known in previous pandemics, and we're not doing that, you see. So now there are issues. Paul is on the money with all his comments. I mean, it's not easy, remember, logistically difficult. The amount of science going into testing at the moment is remarkable, right? I mean, as many companies are in the testing game, many big drug companies have massive diagnostic divisions that they use anyway in hospitals, you know? So they're, they're bringing out new tests all the time. My hope is um, there will be a very effective saliva-based test that can be sent to all our houses. Remember the dreaded iodine tablets? Mm. We do. <laughs> It'll be the same as that, except you'll get a box on your doorstep on Monday with 10 tests in it. You, know, right. you spit in, you see if you're positive. That's a screening test, by the way. Then you might go and have the proper test done next, you see. So these are all happening in other countries. By the way. This, is, this isn't rocket science, of course. And the big question now is, can Ireland now implement best practice? Like and do those tests, do they exist? They do exist. Absolutely. There's been a problem with tests. I mean, some tests are insensitive. There's a high false positive, false negative issue. Mm. But they're working very, very hard to get the best possible tests in place. Because I, 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 I mean, this is sometimes raised with the with the HSE and, and with government, and they say, well, the the. the the number of positives we're getting from the testing we're doing at the moment is so low, the implication seems to be that there's not much point in doing that wider kind of community testing. That, that's very misguided, remember. I mean, the key thing is, the way to hunt the virus down is with testing, and we've been saying this for yeah. months now. Mm -hmm. And my dream is, and Paul would be on the same page, that they listen to us, in a sense. You know? Now, they're trying, and again, as Paul said, it's not easy. You know? But let's hope they begin to implement a very effective testing strategy for the next three, six, nine months at a minimum. Okay. Um, Catherine, uh, Infections are, have been rising over the last yes. while, but hospitalizations haven't risen, ICU admissions haven't risen appreciably anyway, and okay. deaths haven't risen. Uh, so is that that we're getting better at treating people, or is it perhaps that we're discovering more asymptomatic cases that don't get sick? I think it's the latter. Right. I think the age profile is different. The, um, like, at the beginning, you only got tested if you were sick. And you had to have lots of symptoms. I, I know several people who I know had COVID and they didn't actually meet the criteria to be tested. Mm. Um, and I could diagnose them over the phone. Um, so like in the beginning, you were only tested if you were sick. Now they're beginning to test contacts. We're beginning to find lots of asymptomatic carriage. So a large numbers of those test results that you get every day is con known close contacts, people who are not sick and they may, please God, never get sick. Mm. Um, so we're, we're finding you know, more and more cases. So I, I, it, I mean, I think the seroprevalence studies are amazing. I actually think the most, we must, more of us must have had mm, this. Yeah, I, think so. I, I mean, yeah. whatever T cell based immunity there is, yeah. I think we, more of us must have had it than is realized. Yeah. And that in fact, quite a lot of people have had COVID. Yeah based on the surge we got, because we, we, we had 90 admissions to ICU in the second week in March, oh my God. In, a, in a system that had only 190 beds <laughs> okay. to ventilate people. You can see why you were concerned. Mm. Yeah, I, that plus a number of hospitals yeah. were worried about their oxygen supply based on right. what happened in Italy, right. so we had lots of problems. But we did start them. Just before we move on, to symptoms, right? Because yes. at, at the start, we're, you're right, like you had to have a temperature and a cough, or a temperature and a, um, mm. I think loss of, t of taste and smell came in later. How many of the people that actually have COVID have a high temperature? 
because it, it doesn't seem to be all that high. Do you know, I don't know yeah. the answer to that question. Okay. Anybody? Well, you see, it's called the normal distribution. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with <laughs> Any? Oh, sir, please explain. Well, any biological trait, there'll be a range. You know, always. Yes. That. You see, some will have a very high temperature, yes. some may have no temperature at all. The majority will have a temperature yeah. signal, obviously, but there'll be a range. Mm -hmm. And like everything to do with COVID is like anything else in life, in a way. Across a population, you'll see differences. You but know. from a general practice point of view, temperature is effectively irrelevant yeah. almost for us when we're referring people they're not the reasons people ring me they might by you know somewhere subsequent in the conversation I'll say have you got a temperature but it's it's the respiratory symptoms it's the myriad symptoms mm -hmm. and we're going back to this thing of the testing and tracing and who we're testing one of the very good things now is if you have effectively any symptom that could vaguely come into the umbrella of COVID and you ring your GP you'll get a test Yep. because there's, there, there's, we have unlimited testing in that environment. However, I think the bit we're missing are the people who are either asymptomatic, don't have symptoms, um, or have slight symptoms and delay presenting to their GPs. Because another way of looking at it is to flip it around. If you look at the people who are picked up through contact tracing, and they have their day zero test, which is the first test the public health say have it straight away, mm. because you're, you're, you're a contact of a positive case. But then you have another test seven days later. And first of all, 50% of people don't turn up to that, which mm. is a different argument. But of the asymptomatic, the people who do turn up, who were, who were contacts and are still asymptomatic on the day seven test, two to three percent of those are positive. So that will tell you that out there, there are these people who've been exposed to COVID, have no symptoms, even when they've been alerted to pay attention to them. And so they're the type we need to try and catch because they're walking around with the community. And just before being pulled in, symptoms, now we've been told temperature, we've been told cough, yep. we've been told loss of taste or smell, headache, it, for some people? From a GP point of view, headache, sore throat, flu -y, bit of diarrhea, you know, even, even odd, odd rashes. You know, we'll pay attention to anything that could, if, it was, if the only thing you have is an odd rash, no. But if you're also a bit flu -y and achy and have an odd rash, yes, yeah. COVID toes as they're called. I think, David, in terms of fever, I think some of the numbers are quite low, maybe only as low as 25, 30%. Mm. So most would say it's not really a very effective sort of screen, early screen. I think Catherine is a very important point. I've criticised testing a lot, but certainly, you know, major improvements have been made. So I think testing contacts has been really, really important. Mm -hmm. Now, that may explain, as you say, Catherine, you know, why we've you know, rising case numbers, but not many translating mm -hmm. into hospitalisations. Something else that I may think may help there is in terms of, you know, our social distancing measures, even wearing the ma uh, masks. One possibility is that it's actually reducing the viral load. So yes. much virus mm -hmm. you actually mm -hmm. get. Mm -hmm. Um, and that could be a good thing. So going forward, hopefully that trend, that relationship will remain where even though case numbers may increase and increase, but the, the numbers translating into hospitalisation or ICU would hopefully will be lower. So the amount of the virus that you're exposed to uh, determines how sick you yeah, get. So that's, that is... so, that's, so that's a viral dose. So look at myself, like if we work in infection studies where, and with animal models and you infect with a bacteria or a virus, the more bacteria, more virus you give, the sicker the animal gets. So it's the same way. There's a dose effect. Um, so in a situation where if you can reduce that dose, you, it would sort of make sense, certainly in terms of extrapolating from animal models, where that would lead to a lower level of sickness. Yeah, we, we used that in ICU when we were trying to work out, I mean, in, in Wuhan, the nurses who were taking care of really yeah. sick people, that they just bought nurses from everybody because they have a huge population. They only worked a four-hour shift, so they kept changing over because they wanted to reduce the viral load mm. in their PPE. <clears throat> And that's why many um, medical staff, particularly uh, menesis who are exposed and nursing staff in, in ICUs did get COVID and there were a significant number of deaths in Italy at the beginning as there were in the United mm. Kingdom. Um, and Luke, we had some too. Luke, in, in terms of the, the virus is, is mutating all the, all the time really, is there, is, 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 I heard um, um, Navarro, Dave, Dave Navarro from the WHO on the radio, and he was asked whether there was any evidence that the virus might be weakening in, in, in some way. And he said, it's too early to say, but you wouldn't say no yet. Well, every question is a bit like this. It's a moving target. This, the science that's going on is remarkable. There are 50,000 publications about COVID-19 now. And Paul's read them all. <laughs> <laughs> but there's an amazing amount of knowledge here, right? But we're only beginning, you know? Now, there's a number of key questions. Let's see, is, is it mutating? There is a weaker strain in Asia. They've detected it already, which they have evidence for it's slightly weaker. Now, the question is, can that begin to spread? Will that protect you against the more severe strain? That'd be fantastic. So it's unknown, but there's a bit of a hint of a change. But generally speaking, 
thinking it's the same strain. There's tiny differences, by the way, between them, but there's no difference in disease or in symptomology or anything like that. Um, it, but the hope is that that would happen. The second big hope, of course, is that we will be protected if you're infected, and that's a moving target as well. There's at least eight cases now of reinfection for definite. Uh, of those eight, six did well, right, and managed to fight the virus, probably because they were protected from the first infection, or it could be that they got a low-dose virus, there's questions. But two didn't do so well upon reinfection. So again, that's an unknown. Now, there's optimism, by the way, let's say that as well, because, I mean, in my opinion, and, and Paul might comment on this as immunologists, there probably will be some protection, right? That, that's the way the immune system works. Secondly, other viruses might give cross protection. And there's, there's some evidence, the common cold, actually, might give you slight protection against COVID-19. It's also because, coronavirus. Oh, well, that's yeah. right, and, and they're, they're very similar viruses. So you might have T cells to a cold virus. That will also recognize COVID-2 and maybe protect you. This may explain some of the anomalies. Uh, one of the big anomalies is the Vietnamese had a very low rate of infection. There were 300 cases in a country of 100 million people with no distancing. You've seen it's overpopulated. Mm -hmm. There could have been built-in immunity to coronaviruses in that population because of exposure over the last few years. But mind you, we don't know. I mean, again, mm. there's many unknowns here. Okay, I, I'm going to give an opportunity for, for audience questions, but before I do, I've, I've held off asking this question. I'm going to ask yourself and, 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 and Paul, when are we going to get a vaccine? Ah, now, yes, look at the answer. Now, um, <laughs> um, there's a great study done. Now, this is mind-blowing. Are you ready, Dave, for this one? So the City of London got all the world's experts, they've said, together in a room, all the epidemiologists, all the immunologists, all the actuaries, and all those numbers people, to look at the evidence for a vaccine at the moment. And they've given a 76% chance of a vaccine in Q1 next year, right? Isn't that, isn't that alarming? Now, again, I asked them, do you back horses as well? <laughs> but the truth is, there's marvelous progress there. I mean, it's unprecedented. There's 176 vaccines in development, more than ever for malaria, to give you an idea. And that kills millions of people a year. Mm. They're giving a good immune response. They've tested several of them. You get a big immune response in people, much, much more than the natural. There was one great study that showed you get a threefold higher level of antibody with some of these vaccines than the natural infection. So they're really working at that level, right? Big question is the phase three trial has to run. Three trials are running. Uh, one of them, all, by the way, all, each trial has to recruit 30,000 people. It's a massive logistical exercise. 15,000 controls, 15,000 with them all matched. And it has um, to be somewhere where the, where the virus yep. is quite prevalent. Yeah. Now, yeah. Pfizer just announced they fit 23,000 out of 30 in recruit. That's fantastic progress. They will know by November, December, mm. is our prediction, whether their vaccine works. Now, you just keep your fingers crossed. I would be optimistic there will be a vaccine Q1, Q2 next year. It won't be brilliant. It'll give partial protection. Now, that's still good, remember. Anything to help here is superb. And that will lift um, some of the fear, I think. The main effect that will have, by the way, is the headline, vaccine for COVID. People get a bit more confident. Um, governments begin to get a bit less you know, antsy about the whole thing, and you begin to think of relieving some of the restrictions, if that's the case. You then have to decide, of course, who you're going to give it to, yes. who, who can afford to buy it, which country, because every country will be competing with every other country, and some countries, you know, across the Atlantic are going to restrict who else can buy their vaccine. But then, do you give it to the older population? Do you give it to vulnerable groups? Do you give it to healthcare workers? Who's a healthcare worker? Who's a frontline worker? Why, why wouldn't you give it to the bus drivers? You know, and so on and so forth. So, there's a huge... Journalists. Uh, as a, very it, important to have Very important to have so you can see, as a society, we've got a lot of questions to ask and how we prioritise this. Yeah, Paul. So David, I definitely agree with Luke in terms of, I think before the, the year is out, we're going to know. Would it be before the American presidential election? <laughs> I don't think so, I don't think so. Um, actually, I, I think I read there this morning, actually, a number of the manufacturers basically said, listen, they're not going to be rushed to get it out yeah, before, but yeah, whether yeah. that's true or not, I'm not so sure, so sure. I think before the year is out, I think we'll definitely know if one or more of the viruses work. Um, but I think that's just the start because number one in terms of there's an enormous challenge in terms of manufacturing some of the pre-manufacturing has started but even logistical problems I read problems even in terms of you know generating enough glass files syringes and then, glass, and then uh, yeah medical glass yeah. shortage mm. Mm. and then the take up again out of some concerns about these remember these trials now children aren't involved so we will know if they work but I don't think by early next year we're going to be vaccinating children so that's going to be a longer term um, so I think that's going to take some time and then in terms of the uptake of the vaccine, I think that discussion, we need to start working on that now at the moment because many people will have concerns, even though the fact that we're in this, like, you know, 
situation that we're in at the moment, which is sort of unprecedented, I think people are still going to have concerns. And, and we may dismiss them, but we shouldn't, because it's very real to them. And I think that discussion should start now and try to prepare for that. Yeah, because I mean, pe pe people will have legitimate concerns. Well I, I think, well, I think, David, the fact that we've truncated this so much, because normally this, I think the, the quickest vaccine that's ever generated was against months, which is four years. Mm, yeah. And now you suddenly see something being generated within 12 months. Mm, yeah. And people will naturally, and it makes complete sense in terms of, you must have taken shortcuts here, you must have, you know, forgotten about safety, things like that. That is not the case. Like, we're good and still going through all the safety. But again, that discussion, that needs to take place now to allay people's fears and to make sure that, you know, bad information, wrong information doesn't get out there. So, you know, a discussion... Uh, and to hear the concerns and listen to yeah. them, I think that needs to... Because the worst thing you can do is just dismiss the concerns. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, C Catherine, uh, we're heading into the winter. Uh, yep. People are going to be spending more time indoors. Yep. And flu season is coming anyway, yep. uh, which can, the symptoms can be confused. It, 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 can, it could be quite a difficult time. It will. It would be very difficult for Mary and her colleagues because they're going to be inundated. Mm. We're going to be testing more. One would hope that if people comply with the physical distancing, it might actually reduce the severity of our flu season. One would hope. That appears to have been the case in Australia, where they've been very compliant and obviously have taken this extremely um, seriously and have adopted a slightly different way of going about it. But yes, there is a major anxiety amongst us all about what's going to happen in the winter. And um, if we see another surge in cases, and I mean, we, we coped with the surge in cases, but it was the, the other people that we didn't see that we, we you know, that we, we want to, I want to be able to continue to do my scheduled care that requires elective mm. ICU admission. I want to be able to continue to take care of normal people who get normal illnesses. So we do need to expand um, our hospital systems to improve our isolation systems. To, we, the health could consume our entire GDP, actually, I would imagine, no disrespect meant we, we could keep spending on health and, and, and we probably need to be more efficient about how we do it but it's been difficult to be efficient because of the risk of outbreaks in hospitals because we, that's been worrying our mm. hospital systems so we are worried but if we have to surge again we'll surge Okay and Mary just, just that question about flu I mean as, as, as Catherine says there might be a good side effect of this if, that, if people are keeping their distance and wearing masks and washing their hands they might not get flu as often but there is going to be a problem with diagnosis. Mm. I mean, if you think about it, who here has had a cold recently? Almost nobody. I mean, we just, we've all been healthier than we've ever been because of our social distancing and masks and very effective. But coming into the winter, I think, as we move indoors, it's going to be a real challenge. And because we're not able to differentiate between common colds, influenza, and that's going to be the real importance of getting influenza vaccine, you know, into as many people as possible, mm. and COVID, we're going to have to at least interact with people on the phone and, and then send them for COVID testing. And the, the difficulty is, is general practice is, is, is under-resourced and understaffed as it is. And we're about short of about 10% of our GP population before we start it. Now, obviously, with additional retirements and medical you know, isolation, because some colleagues can't work at the front line, we are really, really short of GPs. And it's an interesting, just about how people have become touchier. In the beginning, there was this extraordinary solidarity towards healthcare workers, and we could do no wrong. We were the frontline heroes. And some of us got a little bit, well, actually, that <laughs> we, we didn't want to be clapped. We just wanted to be resourced and supported. Mm. But I think as the population has got a little bit more grumpy and a bit sick of it all, a grumpiness has, has crept into how people interact with the healthcare services. And my hospital colleagues have told me that they're finding people are being pretty tetchy and short when they're trying to do their best. And in general practice, we're finding the same, where people, you know, you, what do you mean you didn't ring me back today? What, what do you mean I have to wait till next week? And just things are different. And I suppose it's, it's everybody in the healthcare service asking people to be patient, that it is different. And, and we are working with very constrained resources. Mm. I, I should say, you, uh, there was a, a cycle organised by well, healthcare was. workers to... Uh, there was. To, uh, I am managing to sit on the seat. <laughs> and you went, how, how far did you cycle? 20, uh, 200k, I think. Wow, mm. okay, well, there you go. Limerick to Dublin. There you go, very mm. impressive. Now, just, um, are there any questions from the audience? Um, I'll have to ask you to speak up, but not shout too much, or <laughs> we'll get in trouble. But yes, sir. Can I take my mask off? I don't no. think... No. It's two questions to do with power and load. You were saying that the nurses in ICU were working four hour shifts. In Wuhan, not in Ireland, but in Wuhan, yeah. Keep the load yes. So one question is, how long does that load stay in your body, and how much of that load do you need to get to be infected? Now, I get the bit, the more you have, if you're infected. But how long does it stay in your body, and how much of it before you're infected? 
it's, it's almost impossible to answer. If you've, if you've got a great immune system, that will kill the virus immediately. You know, fantastic. Even at quite a high load, if you're very sort of immunocompetent, as we say, you'll beat the virus, you know. The more virus that's there, the more pressure there is on the immune system, and suddenly the dose is so high, the immune system fails, and there you get infected. That, that's what happens normally. But it's very genetic. I mean, there's massive variation between us. You might be very healthy, me less so, so you will do better with a certain dose compared to me. So sadly, it's a very complex question to ask. But in general terms, high dose is very bad. Even if you're very healthy, a high dose can floor you. You know? Hence, in the hospitals, they're trying to restrict that to make sure that the people aren't being exposed. It's more to do with time as well. The longer you're there, the more virus might be there and it might build up in various ways. So time is another variable. But e even a high dose can floor anybody. You know? I think in terms as well, in terms of how long it stays, it can stay for quite a length of time. So if you're infected, let's say, today, you have high doses probably within two or three days. That probably lasts for about a week or so and then will dwindle off. But you may be able to detect some of the RNA, that's the test that we use, weeks and weeks after. But most studies can't culture any infectious virus at that stage. And that's very interesting now, actually, because when you test, you also actually get a measure of how much virus is in the swab sample. And some countries, for example, in the US, are looking at the situations now where if there's very little virus, they're equating that would be no longer infectious. Now, that's very useful in terms of you're looking at quarantine, for example. So there's a certain value you can use, and if it goes above that value, you can basically say, actually, the person is no longer infectious. And the reason why they're no longer infectious is because remnants of the virus stays in your body for some time, maybe up to maybe four to six weeks. So it can stay for a long time. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yep. Yeah, that's a great question. Mm. So that's about the uh, zero the, COVID, the zero zero COVID, COVID uh, strategy. Yeah. Um, oh, so, so, yeah, so, so first of all, as you say, the, the benefits and the apparent benefits are enormous, and you know this should be sort of an aspiration. I, I, I myself, I, I don't think it's possible. I think it could have been possible very early on, so with very low numbers of infections, like New Zealand did. But essentially, then I think you have to seal the country. I don't think it's possible to maintain that zero state. So I'm, I'm not sure why you would focus. And, and the other thing they should be aware of is that as you decrease numbers, the cost to remove an individual case becomes higher and higher. People think from going from 10 to 1 is the same as going from 20 to 10. It's not at all. It becomes much more difficult. It's almost as easy to go from 1,000 to 10 as 10 to 1. And we know a lot about how the virus is transmitted now. It's transmitted through these super spreader events. So if you recall back in June, we had very low numbers. We were getting close to zero. Suddenly there was a super spreading event, and now we are where we are today. So number one, in terms of getting there, I, I don't think it's possible now. Number two, in terms of maintaining it, I think you'd have to seal the country. I, do, I, I don't think there's very much of a difference between the suppression and going to zero. Like I want to get it down as low as possible. I think you can do that with sensible measures, restrictions, that allows the country to open up but supplement that with a really good testing and tracing system. And I think we should focus those resources on mass testing for the high risk. So the high risk facilities like, for example, uh, nursing homes, meat factories, healthcare workers. So I think that's where we should focus as well as obviously testing symptomatics and then contact. So I think that's the approach that should be taken. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, I mean, I think we all agree. I mean, zero was a very ambitious target. It's a bit like saying to a 10-year-old, you're going to win a gold medal in the Olympics, you know? Keep training and you might get there. So, so to me, it's all about getting the viral count right down. We've got to suppress it as much as we can. we will very hard to get to zero because it's so contagious. But the big issue about this virus is it's very contagious. So with the best of it in the world, New Zealand kind of got there, but there's still cases, as we've seen there anyway. But the, but the mission is very simple. And the government, uh, this is their policy, of course, anyway. They're not going to say it's not the policy. It's just to get the virus numbers right down as much as we can. But I look at history as well, and lockdowns have never eliminated a virus. So I'm not sure why we think we can do it with this. My own sense, if I would ask, and it's obviously a dangerous thing to predict, I think we'd probably end up with this virus becoming endemic. Because yeah. even with a vaccine, I think I, I'd be very hopeful in terms of getting a vaccine that's protective, probably partially protective. I think it'll protect us from getting very sick, like the flu vaccine. I think the bar for getting what we would call sterilizing immunity, preventing you from getting infected, I think that's a very high bar. And I'm not sure if we're going to get there. So I think we're going to end up where this becomes, and we have already four coronaviruses that cause the common cold. I think we're probably going to end up in a situation where the virus becomes endemic. But again, that's just... And can we, li and can we live with it if it's, if it's endemic? Well, I think so, David, but then over time, say. especially with a vaccine. So if you get a vaccine and you rule out that uh, vaccine, most people will have protection. And even if it's not full protection stopping you getting infected, it'll stop you getting very sick. So if you can stop people getting into, you know, interacting with yeah, Catherine, and that's, that's a good thing. We can live with it if we, if we take the opportunity opportunity to address the super spreader events yeah. and, and actually really use the opportunity to say where are the bigger outbreaks coming and, and take those areas and say we're going to actually fundamentally change parts of Irish society and how. So the obvious one is, is, is in congregated settings, you know, and with nursing homes, we discussed it, but in the meatpacking plants. Mm. And what is it about meatpacking plants? It's largely low paid workforces yep. who, who live in congregated settings themselves, who move between packing plants. And then what's the, direction, the link then into direct provision? And you know, we have a government commitment to, to end direct provision. We've now got a situation where direct provision in meatpacking plants are, are a significant super spreader events in this is what happened in Kildare. So we need to say now, now they need to close. There are many, many reasons to close direct provision, but we have a public health one. Yeah. And similarly with traveler communities, Roma communities, marginalized communities, they're all clusters and this is our opportunity. Let's sort them out and let's make societal change on the basis of that. But we saw, for instance, in, in South Korea, I think nightclubs were mm. a super spreader event. So does mm. that mean nightclubs are over as far as Ireland is concerned? I think effectively, yes. We're looking into well into next year, I think. But if you ask society, what do they want? What do Irish people want? The most important things they wanted, they want schooling for their children, just education in general, and they want their health service to work. Nightclubs come way down on the pecking order. They just do, you know, and so they're the things we need to prioritise. Okay. Um, any other questions from the audience? We're nearly out of time. Uh, doesn't look like it. Um, just wanted to pick up one or two mm. things. Um, you mentioned people not showing up for their mm. tests which is kind of shocking. The figure yesterday was, I think, uh, about a quarter of mm. about a thousand people. Uh, I'm not sure if that was a week or a day. It must have been a, a day. Um, that's a lot of people. But how much of that is people not turning up? How much of it is the authorities not getting in contact with them, do you think? Because no, I've heard of a couple it, of occasions. It's not turning up. It's, it's a really interesting one. I think more work needs to be done on it because these are people who've rung their GP had their consultation, had the electronic referral we can do, and received a test <clears> time and then don't turn up. So what's that piece about? What's, you know, is it that the test centre is inaccessible? And that, that has been an issue. There is a presumption that you've got transport. But if you don't have transport, you're, you're discouraged from going on public transport. Mm. How do you get there? We need localised you know, pop-up testing in many, many areas. We had a situation there a number of weeks ago where people from Galway had to go to Castle Bar because the Galway testing centre wasn't functioning. You know, that needs to not happen. So, but I think there's, there's some definite messaging that needs to go in that if you've gone to all the trouble of ringing and getting the appointment, why aren't you going? And we need to address that. And there's, so it's, it's, while wear a mask is, is important, wash your hands is important, there's myriad other things that we need to look at. Okay. Uh, a stupid question to end, Luke. Um, some places I go, the hot air dryer is turned off. Other places, it's not. Am I in danger 
when somebody is using the hot air dryer. What makes you think I know the answer? To that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I surely a journalist, but, that you surely know a journalist would know the answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> you yes, off the hot um, air. Well, I don't know, but certainly you don't want to be in a stagnant room. Let's put it that way. Where there's a hot air dryer blowing the virus around, that's a big negative. You know, so <laughs> if there's good ventilation, who cares about the dryer? <laughs> that's the right answer. Yeah. Um, and finally, Catherine, um, this time next year, will we be still with these restrictions, or will we be back? to normal in terms of uh, events like this? I hope that this time next year, because as a society we're going to work out what works and what doesn't work, that we will be back to something a bit more, um, a bit better. I mean, we, we, we're going to learn. And, and, and a big part of this is learning and communication and not demonising various segments of our population. So go and talk to people about why they did whatever they did, which was perceived as being very bad. I mean, if you're 20 year old you're actually going to want to go to a nightclub mm. so we're going to have to find some way of a 20 and 25 year olds to go out and meet their peers and for them to actually get on with their lives and to meet their partners and to do whatever it is they do and um, you know like I did when I was their age like we have to address all of that the socializing element so we will I think get there but we're going to learn how to do it differently. Perhaps we could For go back to dancing at the crossroads. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> it's it's like in the rain. I mean, the biggest issue for youngsters now, I see it because I have them myself, is it, the weather's getting bad. And they were doing huge amounts of their socialising outside. They were being really compliant, fantastic, but now the weather's bad. And, they, and they, they don't have the money to be continually going into restaurants, strokes, bars, spending their nine euros. You know, now some of them are getting pizza boxes with receipts, to, so have that instead. You know, um, so we, need to, we do need to pay attention to the young people. I think I really agree with this point. They've done the heavy lifting. Yeah. They have sacrificed the most, whether it's socially, educationally, and, and we need to be really aware of that. Okay. Yeah. And Paul, cautious optimism, would you say? Yeah, I would. Uh, like, obviously, I've some major concerns, health services one, in terms of you know, the rate of which, like we're just doing maybe 67% of what we normally do, I think that's a big problem. Yep. I, I think the, the narrative is, and discussion is probably going to change, I think in the, over the next year, I think more the focus is going to be on the economy, I think. Um, you know, when I hear you know, economists like Dan O'Brien and that, it seem to me like quite measured and informed, and it's almost that, I don't think that message has got out yet. Um, and I saw some even in the RT news yesterday in terms of, you know, half the people thinking we should have even more mm. restrictions in place. And I think that's, that's coming down the road. And, but that and the health service would be some major okay. concerns. And Luke, if we get through this winter, maybe better times ahead. I, no doubt about it. I mean, the other thing to mention that we haven't touched on, therapies are getting better as mm -hmm. well, remember? Sorry, yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a really good thing, obviously. Big study last week mm -hmm. showing 20% less deaths on ventilators if you're on dexamethasone, this mm -hmm. drug. That's really good. And we're going to see more. There are over 1,000 trials running with anti-inflammatories at the moment to stop the people getting sick if they're in hospital. As Catherine said, prevention is better than cure by a mile. <laughs> But the fact is, people will end up in hospital, and I'm sure you'd agree, there will be better treatments coming up as well. So that gives us grounds for optimism. To me, it's all about taking the fear out of it, mm. in a rational way, not just happy, clappy yeah. way. Mm. Yeah. The fear goes out of it if a vaccine works partially, if these therapies get better, right. if we keep following the very thing Paul said, the usual things, keep following, and then remember, people have to get their lives back. That's the key. Yeah. Mm. They have to get their lives back. Well, just on that, on that, finally, 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 on that point, Catherine, about the improvements in therapies, because obviously in... Yeah. in February and March. So we changed quite a bit of things. We yeah. stopped intubating early very quickly, which we think made a difference. We didn't universally use steroids in Ireland and our ICU mortality is the same as the control mortality in that study, but there is no doubt that there is a solid signal that steroids in some populations do work. Now I've lived in medicine for 35 years and I've seen steroids come and steroids go mm. <laughs> more than once. Mm. And there has been, uh, the long-term use of steroids in the ICU population is not good, but there does seem to be a decent signal for the use of steroids in this group. And there is logic to it mm. in terms of what happens to people that get very sick. So I do think we will now be using dexamethasone, which is cheap and readily available and easy to give. Okay. Um, and we will, uh, our worry would be super infection, so we'll keep an eye on that. So the, and to be fair, that trial was very pragmatic. It wasn't perfect, but it was a particularly impressive trial that they ran in the United Kingdom. Okay. So, and so it did drop mortality, both in ICU and in hospitalized patients who required oxygen, if I remember rightly. Um, it's an interesting study, and the, the, the actual effort that they put into it was amazing. They were ready. They had it ready to run for a pandemic. Hmm. It's like the, the, we were collecting data which was also ready to run for a pandemic called SARI. So we, mm. we've got a sprint SARI. Okay, so we're learning more. Oh, yeah, every day. We learn. That's why you, 
That's why in any disease like this, you want to get it later on, put it off because we'll know more and we'll have better treatments. <laughs> okay. well, Unless you get very old, which might not be great. Okay. Well, with that sound advice, yeah, uh, yeah. We'll, we'll wrap up. But to Luke, to Catherine, to Mary, uh, to Paul, thank you very much indeed for those insights and thank you for the work that you're doing and that you'll continue to do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to our actual audience and our virtual audience for uh, uh, sitting through this fantastically enlightening session. Isn't it marvelous what you can learn when people aren't yelling at each other <laughs> and there's no blood on the ground and there isn't a moderator who's trying to stir up trouble? <laughs> so I want to thank our, our fantastically expert um, panelists. Uh, I learned a great deal and I'm sure all of you did from listening to them. And particularly to thank our wonderful moderator, David McCullough. Thank, thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.